Thanks, Tom. There's a long introduction. I feel embarrassed now. <laughs> Hope I can live up to your uh, expectations. So I'm going to talk about uh, some aspects that I've done on memory. In particular, I'm going to go beyond what people read in a textbook. So if something is very novel, then just put your hand up and I will answer your question. Just feel free to interrupt me. Um, as Tom said, that most of what I do is um, computational modeling mostly in the neurocomputational aspects and testing the models using empirical um, experiments. So these experiments typically are either experimental, so you vary one parameter and you see what happens in the behavior of a person, or differential, people are different, and you see how effects in the uh, kind of literature vary from person to person. And my, most of my work relates to working memory. So here, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the control of memory. Um, what I do typically is uh, free serial and acute recall in patients and non-patients. I've done some work on individual differences in active maintenance and complex cognition, like reasoning. A is larger than B, C is smaller than D, uh, B is larger than D, which one is the smallest? That's a very complicated test. What do you do in order to do the test? You use your short-term memory system for that. Um, also, I've done some work on uh, the role of short-term memory in sentence uh, comprehension, typically at the sentence and at the word level. That's the levels I've been looking at. Now, for today's talk with uh, working memory processes, uh, since the 1990s, a lot of people now are aware that working memory is not just one thing. It's not just one function. It's a number of things. You may find aspects of attention control. What we're going to talk about is active maintenance and output monitoring. But I also have um, uh, done some work on dual tasking and strategy formation. Uh, recently, with Dave Huber, I've been looking at distract, uh, suppression of distracted information, so having a perceptual account for that. So before you fall asleep, one thing I want you to uh, remember an activation-based approach to working memory, which is specified in detail through neurocomputational modeling, provides a framework in which the adaptive and dynamic nature of working memory can be investigated and its utility assessed. So here I want to address working memory as an activation-based process and how that relates to aspects um, in the front of literature. Here I'm going to focus on one aspect, which is pre-call memory. So I'm going to talk about the short-term versus long-term memory debate. Um, then address the aspect of activation-based working memory. What is, what is it? Um, I'm going to talk about the model that I've been working on the last few years. And I want to go beyond the debate. I want to go beyond <coughs> to saying, well, is there short-term memory or is, isn't there not a short-term memory? Just go beyond that and see what's the utility of that. If you have a short-term memory, it should be functional in some ways. What is this function? So first, the um, um, short-term versus long-term memory debate. When you look in textbooks, typically what you find is that William James said a long time ago that memories come to us as belonging to the, of the rearward portion of the present space of time and not to the general past. He, refers, uh, he relates that to primary memory, to contrast it with secondary memory where phrases are very much in the past. So primary memory, primary memory would be things that you have feeling that it was still lingering on. Um, this stayed for a very long time in the um, almost obscurity, you would say. Um, but in the 60s, a lot of people um, focus on memory as such, verbal learning, um, storing of information, retrieving of information. The computer was just appearing um, in our daily lives or daily research lives, and uh, we made, or they made a model out of, um, they, they likened the memory to um, the computer model. So in textbook you will find that information in the environment comes to us through the sensory system, everything enters the system, what we attend to may go to the short-term memory system. In the system you can rehearse, if you don't rehearse, you will forget the information and you will not be able to encode the long-term memory. But we can talk about the capacity of the short-term memory, if it's item-based or if it's time-based. 
late 70s, uh, more refinement of the long-term memory system had been proposed in episodic, semantic, procedural, etc. What we are not told about in the textbooks is that there is a big debate about the nature of short-term memory and how it fits within the whole um, memory system. What we, what we are to told about is in the free recall paradigm, where you have a number of items. Here, each square represents, say, a word in a variable memory domain. So you see eight words, one after the other. And at the end of the list, you have to report all of the words in any order you like. What you typically find is that if you set the proportion correct against the input position, you'll have better recall for the first few items, primacy effect, and better recall for the last few items, recency effect. In the 60s, this recency effect was um, explained by these items still be in a short-term memory system. And at, re at retrieval, you retrieve the items from short-term memory. Other items are not part of short-term memory. You retrieve them from long-term memory. The primacy effect is due to more rehearsals for the first few items than for the middle few items. So they're stronger in your long-term memory. Now, one prediction of this would be if you now destroy the contents of short-term memory, this recency effect would disappear. And this is exactly what happens if you add a distractor task, let's say counting backwards in threes, um, you destroy the recency effect. So this is a, a good um, a win for the uh, dual store uh, approach. Long-term memory versus short-term memory. However, what we're not told is that there is another test called the continuous distracted test or the continual distracted test. You may find it as a through list distractor test in, in literature as well, where you have a distractor before and after every word. So the blue ones here are words, the red ones are distractors. Now what happens, you would expect, even at the last one, we expect no recency profile in the say, position curve because the last item cannot be in long-term memory, in short-term memory because of the distractor. All right, clear recency gradient is observed and also clear primacy gradient is observed. Whatever this recency gradient is, it cannot be from short-term memory because we added a distractor to destroy short-term memory. In the literature, this is called the long-term recency effect, referring to uh, the fact that this is not from short-term memory, has to be from long-term memory, but still shows this VC gradient. Now, this gives us a problem. So how to account for this fact? Now, dual sort theories would say that this, the short and long-term uh, recency effect are due to different things, due to different mechanisms. Um, the short-term effect would be due to a short-term memory effect, uh, the long-term recency is due to uh, some aspect of long-term uh, memory retrieval. But the single store theories uh, tend to say that both short and long-term memory are due to the same mechanism. Now, what could <coughs> the same mechanism be? If you liken the, the metaphor here, where every spike here is actually a word presented in time, and here this is the timeline, then at retrieval, you'll be at the end looking back to all the items that have been presented. Now, if you liken this metaphor, then the very few items will be very close together in your perspective. So they're not very distinct. So you'll be very poor at recalling those items. Whereas the last few, you're very able to distinguish. So you would expect a, in an immediate recall paradigm that you view all of those items, and you're very well able to report this item and all the other ones. So you get a nice recency profile. For delayed free recall paradigm, you just have a number of distractors here. So what you actually see at test is everything from this end. Now, these lines are more close together, meaning you're less likely to distinguish between them. Hence, recency effect drops. But if you add distractors between each item, what happens then, the, um, 
the spikes here disappear, and now it's very easy to distinguish between these eyes again, meaning that distinctiveness could account for both the short-term recency gradient and the long-term recency gradient. Um, hence, these single-store models, uh, single-store theories, have uh, applied the um, the ratio rule or the distinctiveness theories to account for both short and long-term um, recency effects in pre-recall. So the argument is that single sort theories can explain both types of recency. Qualitative similar ver effects are found of variables on short and long-term recency. And therefore, there's no need to postulate a separate short-term buffer to account for pre-recall performance, especially when it comes to recency effects. But as a problem, if you assume that short-term memory is not uh, necessary for um, uh, short versus long-term recency effects, then you have to account for other patterns in the literature as well, including dissociations between short and long-term recency. And this is where um, what the core of the current short-term versus long-term memory debate is about. How do we account for dissociations between short and long-term recency? So let's look at one of those associations. In the 60s, Murdoch showed um, that if you increase the list length of, um, of the items to record it, so you have here a 10-item list versus a 15-item list, then um, <coughs> there are a few things to notice. One is the last few items of uh, each curve overlap whereas the overall profile of the longer list is lower than the overall profile of the shorter list. This is a basic list length effect in immediate free recall. In that literature, uh, in the beginning it was assumed that the last few items are reported from short-term memory, so there's no need to, um, you're not um, confused by other items that are already in long-term memory. However, if that is a short-term memory effect, how would one account for the similar effect in one of those continuous distractor paradigms, where after each word you have a distractor? Still, long lists have a lower overall probability than shorter lists, and the last few items are uh, overlapping between a short and a long list. Green in 86 argued that because this is similar as what we already know in the image free call literature, this is an association which follows naturally if you assume there's a single mechanism underlying both the short-term recency and the long-term recency. Recency in a immediate recall paradigm and recency in a continuous extractor paradigm. Of course, this is, a, this is not so much of an interesting thing, and it's easy to model in the model of um, what I have, the dual store model where the last few items in image free call are reported from short-term store, whereas the, in a continuous distractor is the overlap between the test context and the context of the encoding. So the last few items are very close to the endpoint, and it's easy to retrieve them versus the other ones. And for the short and the long list, it's always the last few uh, items of that list. Um, so that cannot be held as a uh, argument against a short-term buffer. But do we have an argument against a single-store system? So here's an uh, interesting um, data finding where in a immediate free call versus a contagious structure free call, if you present the items one after the other, and at retrieval you're told, retrieve, start your retrieval from items from the beginning of the list, versus start your retrieval from items from the end of the list. So you either report items from the end of the list, you get a nice recency curve, or you start with items from the beginning of the list and the recency disappears. This is easy to account for in a, a dual store model where because you're going back to the beginning of the list, you lose the information that's all, that was already in your short-term memory system. Whereas in uh, continuous extractor free recall, 
all of the items are reported from long-term memory. So wherever you start in the list will not have an effect on the actual zero position function. And what we see is that the receipt gradient is unaffected um, by this manipulation. So this is a dissociation to account for. Another one is what we know from the amnesic syndrome, where we know that amnesic patients have problems with retrieving from long-term memory compared to short-term memory. And here's the data that's being presented where um, this, the solid lines here are the um, uh, controls, healthy controls, and here are the amnesic patients' results. I can see here that they are equal for the last few items. Short-term recency is unaffected in amnesic patients, which would, is easy to account for if we assume that there's a short-term memory that's unaffected in amnesic patients, whereas retrieval from long-term memory is affected. Now, because all of the items in a uh, continuous extractor are retrieved from uh, long-term memory, all of the items will be affected in the amnesic patients, and exactly what they found. Again, in a model that is a dual store model, this is easy to account for by decreasing the parameter that relates to retrieving from long-term memory. So short-term memory is unaffected, short-term recency is unaffected, whereas long-term recency is affected, meaning that the overall uh, difference <laughs> is larger here than there, but there's still a recency gradient. The temporal aspect or the, the temporal um, uh, context is unaffected in patients, but the overall level of retrieving from the context is affected. Again, this is hard to account for in um, a single store model, and that leads, this leads to an, a prediction, a prediction that we verified where if we vary anything relating to retrieval from long-term memory, we should get this kind of profile. Um, short-term recency unaffected, long-term recency affected. And this is where we go to the um, product interference um, test, where product interference relates to interference that you get during retrieval from secondary memory. So you see two lists, for example, uh, two lists of animals. You retrieve the first list followed by the second list of animals. <coughs> You retrieve them. The last few items are unaffected uh, by the product interference, whereas the first <coughs> few items are. Retrieving from long-term memory is affected in this paradigm. And this is exactly what we found. So we have list one, list two. You're better able to report items from list one compared to list two. But the last few items are unaffected in immediate free recall but in continuous extractive free recall, we see that the last few items are affected. And actually, there was a prediction that the, this is the data. There was a prediction of the model that it was here, that the last few items are exactly the same for the model and are different <coughs> for um, the continuous extractive paradigm. So it's quite difficult. So this is the summary of the short-term and long-term uh, memory debate. And it's quite difficult to see how a single store model can account for all these different dissociations. Whereas for a dual store model, it's, it's easier to do. Now, I said in the beginning that I was uh, going beyond the textbook. In a textbook, we learn about the modal model. But what I'm going to present here is an activation-based working memory system. So we have to stand still for a moment and think about this activation-based approach. So let's go back to uh, James. He said that that memories come to us as belonging to the uh, rear portion of present space of time and not the general past. So it's something that's still there reverberating. In the, this is a quote that's been uh, cited very often, was not very cited very often, is in the same paragraph where he said that all stimuli whose first nerve vibrations have not yet ceased seem to be conditions of our getting this feeling of the species present. So it's about what happens after the item is, uh, after the stimulus is taken away, what lingers on. <coughs> that is what causes us to feel this uh, primary memory. But we can go beyond that. 
So as Ken Schiffen suggested that short-term store is an active portion of long-term store, but Don Norman um, said in an interesting paper that the initial activation of the storage causes temporary traces to appear and they dissipate unless some action is taken to maintain them. This action is primary memory. Okay. So primary memory is a process, not a system. So if you look at the debate, people refer, uh, people look at whether or not there's a short-term memory system. But we're not addressing a system here, we're addressing a process. So how to conceive of this? Again, you have sensory input coming into the system. The sensory registers activate portions of the long-term memory, your long-term knowledge. So sensory information goes to the long-term memory store, an actual system is store, activates aspects in that store. This activation is maintained uh, through a, a short-term store that, that have bidirectional connections with the long-term memory um, component. This is the only diagram that I could find that actually has a number of features in them. Uh, and even this um, is updated in recent years. For example, um, you can see at the, 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 um, the dates that this is all relatively new stuff and more and more people are starting to realize that we have to go away from the computer metaphor and go closer to an activation-based approach to uh, working memory. We have Badley saying that for phonological knowledge, we have Cowan and Oberhauer relating that in uh, um, focus of attention, and we have Engel who starts from the tension part instead of the more memory part. So, and my view would be a combination of Cowan and Engel, just in case anyone wonders. Um, so now let's get deeper into towards the model. Um, the neural substrate of primary memory. So we talk about what happens after stimulus offset. So activation of the of items that have not yet ceased. So you can either say it's the same substrate um, and it's just sensory persistence. I will show an example of that later. That's fully compatible with the single store approach. Or you could say it's a different neural substrate that's more likened as a modal model kind of viewpoint. And in effect, if you look closely at the literature, the debate is between these two versions. Whereas an intermediate version where it's the same substrate with actively maintained activations is not being uh, addressed very much. Now, I did put the names of people in here, but as a matter of fact, not a lot of people really say explicitly how they see the neural substrate. Um, hence, the debate just keeps going on because people are speaking a different language. So the problem with activation-based working memory is that it's um, too general and therefore, what Belly says, theoretically sterile, unless we specify in detail the processes that are involved. So if you assume an activation-based approach, you have to specify in detail how it works. And that's where neurocomputational modeling comes in. Computational, because it forces you to ask the question how it works. Neuro, because there's a lot of literature in the, uh, with monkeys and with fMRI <coughs> um, that you can use for uh, building your theories and, and, and testing your theories. So what is this model that uh, I've been alluding to? I start from three simple um, uh, statements. One is the less, so I'm looking at verbal recall. That's what I've been doing. Uh, but this could also be applied for visual uh, memory, but then you would have a different neural substrate for um, the visual areas. Um, so here's lexical information is stored in the posterior areas, in this case, IT. Um, left of prefrontal cortex support active maintenance. It does not store the items. There's no clear evidence that the activation that you see in left of prefrontal cortex is the representation of that item. 
it's learn over time, it's adaptive, you can unlearn it and learn other things. There's a lot of um, single neuron accounts for that. Mute temporary alias uh, support absolute encoding and retrieval. It's a bit ambiguous whether it's only encoding or only retrieval or both, so just leave it as um, it supports absolute memory in general. The basic model is as follows, where this part is this, the short-term memory component, this part is the contextual uh, component. Each unit, each circle here represents a unit, and these are all connections. So each unit here represents a lexical semantic representation, say dog or cat, but it can also uh, refer to a chunk, say three plus four. Um, and the units compete for activation. So all of these units want to be activated, um, and this rounded circle arrow here refers to that they inhibit one another. They want to be the winning uh, unit that goes into your consciousness. Now, combine that with an, a, a, um, a contextual system where um, the, the, these units represent a particular contextual uh, distribution um, that gets connected with whatever unit here is active, and these are the connection weights. The larger the circle, the stronger the connection. Um, and But the uh, contextual unit changes here. Uh, we use that as a contact that changes in a random walk process. It doesn't have to be in a random walk process. It could be a Markov chain. The main thing is that context drifts away from where you started. So if you start here, you drift away from that starting point, and this is an example. This gives you the contextual overlap. At retrieval, you are closer to this context than to this context. Hence, you're more likely to, to retrieve more recent items from long-term memory. This gives you the long-term recency effect, as we will see in a minute. Um, so let's, let's zoom in on this model. So this is an activation-based buffer with these circles representing chunks or items. Um, this arrow here represents the self-recurrent excitation. This helps the um, unit to maintain its activi activity. So this would be the mem primary memory process. Um, we have a global inhibition, so all of these units compete for activation. And here I just simplified the contextual unit here. And th the, these links are strengthened during encoding uh, via Habian weight chains, meaning that this is always active during encoding. Whatever is active above threshold gets this connection strengthened. So now let's get some equations here. Looks very loud, but I will show you what, what happens here. So each unit here has an activation Let's call this activation X. And this represents the change in activation over time T. So the change of X over the change of T. So at each time step, we're going to change, update the activation in the units. Now, this change is dependent on what it already is, the activation. So if you have a high activation, they are more likely to uh, have a low, um, higher step down in activation but it's sensitive to the input. If you give it an input, then what it wants to do is reach that level in, of activation. So when this is zero, the activation in the system, in, the, in that unit, equals uh, the input. Now, the next one is the self-recurrent excitation. So this by itself is just sensor persistence. It increases in activation, you take the input away and then decrease it again. This, when input is taken away, the alpha parameter here causes this input to recycle. So now you're able to maintain the activation level for a while. So we heard this before, some action is taken to maintain them. This is an action that maintains the activation. But if we do that, we would act, uh, maintain all of them indefinitely. We know where there's a capacity limitation. Uh, we know we cannot maintain all of the items indefinitely. Uh, we also know that in the brain, there are a lot of inhibitory interneurons. 
and that's where the global inhibition comes in. So all of the other items that are active inhibit uh, the activation. So you have a number of items become active. Once you retain its activation, but it's inhibited by other items that's also active. So you have a competition between becoming active, maintaining active, and um, inhibiting other active items. And there's some random noise added to the system as well. So this is the basic equation for uh, this buffer component. And um, this equation down here only says how um, the strength between this unit and that unit is updated according to above threshold activation. Yeah. So in a buffer, there are two important things. It's an alpha parameter and a beta parameter. The more alpha, the more able to maintain items. The more beta, the um, lesser uh, uh, capacity. So what is this sensor persistence? If you now present an item one after the other, like you do in a meat free call paradigm, activation increases, and then after, uh, here after 500 iterations, activation decreases again. That little bit here is sensor persistence for the red item here. So alpha would be zero. Now compare that where alpha is not zero, so the activation is being maintained over a number of time, but because other items are activated, they then push the first item in act down in activation. The competition leads to capacity limitation. Now to show you that it's not an artifact of this having higher activation, here's what you would expect if you measure that and put it on the same level. This is still sensor persistence, this is active maintenance. This tells you there is uh, a primary memory process. Okay, so now let's get an intuition of the alpha and beta parameters. This is the deepest we go into the model. Um, so here's a plot where there's lateral inhibition on the x-axis, there's self acceptation on the y-axis, and what you see here is uh, a simulation of 10 units being activated simultaneously. And you're going to see what this network is doing. So what you see is that, um, so and here's an example, um, the number of items that are still active above a 0.2 level after about 2,000 2, iterations. So we update this equation for 2,000 times. And we, see, and we count how many are still active above 0.2. This is where nothing is active. This is where all of them are active. And you can see here an interesting pattern where you have an inhibition that's very high. There's an activation that's also very high. And here on this graph, you see what happens. There's a few items that are able to really uh, uh, strengthen their own activation and thereby inhibiting the other items. So you can here see that all the other items are suppressed. And at the end, you only have one winner. So this is a system with high inhibition and high act act activation that causes a winner-take-all system. Only one out of 10 reaches a high level of activation. If we now decrease the inhibition to here, you can see there's no selection whatsoever. All the items are active above this 0.2 level. And if we now decrease alpha, you can see that all of them are now still active, but below the 0.2 level. So these two parameters, alpha and beta, are the most critical ones in this model. Just yeah. one question yeah. to the model. Um, uh, based on the parameters, uh, are you assuming that there's a lateral inhibition occurring, or is Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so all the items inhibit all of them. Okay. Yeah. And that's modeled by having, <coughs> um, that's modeled by uh, summing all of the uh, activations of the other ones. Um, so, in, in one paper, uh, what we did was um, have a, a neuromodulation of these parameters where we can vary, we can go along this line and uh, have a system that either maintains a number of them versus selects a few of them. 
So we can actually vary across that. So this is what the, what the model can do uh, inside. This is the, the structure of the model. Now, how does it relate to pre-recall? <coughs> so if you present a number of items, here are six items, one after the other, activation increases and decreases. If you don't do anything after a while, so you don't present any, any other items, the last few will maintain active because we have this alpha parameter. Um, now, in immediate pre-recall, at this time, the TR, you start to retrieve whatever you have in your memory system, whatever is active above a threshold. If you now count how often it appears, you will see that, uh, because it's noisy, there's a nice recency gradient you can find in proportion of items active. Yeah. So the short-term recency effect is accounted for by those items that are still active above the threshold in this activation-based working memory system. Now, it gives a very interesting prediction, which in the beginning was very counterintuitive, but I've replicated that in a number of times. The model has to predict the following. So this is, again, the same uh, picture. You have items being presented, one af after the other, um, and at the end of the whole sequence, there's only a few that are still active above threshold, typically the last ones that have been presented. If you now speed up the presentation rate, so the duration of each item is shorter, so here it's uh, 400 iterations, and we, we go all the way to 100 iterations, the, the first few items become active and stay active for a while. At this time where you should start to retrieve, you actually retrieve the first few items earlier and not the last few items. It turns out that the last few, the other items do not even enter the, the buffer. Why? Because we have this inhibition. Because some of these items have already entered the buffer, there's inhibition in the system. And now it's very difficult to get something else in that system um, without, um, if you don't have, allow it to accrue enough uh, activation. Yeah. So this gives a prediction that with increase in presentation rate, you would go from a recency profile to a primacy profile. And this is exactly what we um, found in, uh, in, in participants. We presented six items at 800 milliseconds per word, which is very doable, and get a very nice uh, primacy, uh, uh, recency gradient. This is an acute recall, so we can do, we can probe each uh, position. I've replicated this in a free recall paradigm as well, with longer lists, uh, eight words per list, and again in 15 words per list. Um, if you know, speed it up to 100 milliseconds per word, you get just a, gr a primacy gradient. And this is what the model um, shows. This is a very strong prediction of the model. The, the model has to predict that. You cannot go around and say the model is unable to predict this. It produces that, no matter how you fiddle with the parameters. So that was quite nice. So we have short-term recency is due to an activation gradient. We have um, long-term recency is due to decreasing contextual overlap because we have a change in context. So we have two types of sources underlying the two different types of recency effect. And between the two, uh, we have this uh, weight-based system that forms uh, an episodic memory matrix, which you can use to retrieve items from long-term memory. Yeah. So just only focus this time on uh, the buffer. There are other aspects one could address with the, uh, the change in context. I have another model where I actually implemented a distributed version of that. And of course, it will be exactly the same. So we've applied the model to a bunch of um, dissociations, and it makes testable predictions. So here we have a model that is useful. But we want to go beyond that. So what also said was that um, one thing you can do is just look at the serial position functions. But you can also go beyond just serial position functions. Um, yeah, I already said this. Um, so typically people look at the 
serial position function with recency and primacy. This is, again, an immediate serial recall um, <laughs> test. We can also look at the first thing that's being recalled from um, in a paradigm like this. And this is the triangles over here. It's a first recall probability. So those items are more likely to be retrieved first and then other items. The successor items are here in square. You can still see a nice uh, recency gradient for the successor items, but nothing for the remainder. So there's more information we can get out of analyzing a simple image free recall paradigm. Now, I just want to zoom in on this um, um, first recall probability. Why is it that this is flat? And in some articles, you may find that it still has a very interesting um, recency gradient. Now, here's zooming in on um, that profile. You have um, the first recall probability, the less few items are more likely to be retrieved than the other items. In this particular data, it's quite flat for the last few items. What I would say here is that the first recall probability reveals the functional size of the activation buffer. So whatever you do during encoding, either you um, have people doing semantic uh, um, ratings on the words presented, it will affect the functional size of the buffer. Because we have the alpha and the beta parameter, we can modulate them. Hence, the, um, the buffer is not fixed to a number of slots, like three or four. It could be larger, it could be smaller. It could even be one. If it's just one, you just get um, uh, a single exponential function for the first recall probability. But how to account for this pattern? Now, we know that if you run a model like I showed you before, and you, at the end of the list, look at the strength between the context and the items, so this episodic <laughs> strength here, these are all the items, the very first few items are very strong because you've rehearsed them, you've done all kinds of stuff with them. Um, then there's a plateau, and then for the very last few items, you have less of a strength, because the last few item had had little time to really accumulate enough um, strength than before last, etc. So here we have that this item is strongest than those. Um, and what I do in the model is these strengths push the activation in the system. And they reach a particular threshold. The first one that, that reaches the threshold will be output and will uh, add to this um, first recall probability function. So this is all color coded, so I will just point out what is what. So here at this time, this is the point where you get a probe saying, okay, now retrieve. Now retrieve the items. This item here, the red one, of those that are gonna see um, colors, this item here, this corresponds to an item minus four from the end of the list. But as in activation, so here's activation presented on the y-axis. In the middle here, you have the um, minus three item, then you have the minus two item, and the very last item will have the highest activation, because I showed you this short-term recency gradient. If you now use these strengths to push the activation, we saw the equations that if you just have an input, it will reach that input level after, after some time. Now, that means that the one that is highest active at the end of the list will go to a, a very low um, um, stable activation level compared to ones that are earlier presented in the list. Now, if this is the um, retrieval threshold, in this dynamical model, what we we'll do is the ones that are active at the time of retrieval and have the highest uh, episodic trace strength will reach the um, threshold first, unless there's a lot of noise, and then even the last few item is able to win a competition. So what we have here is that this item here, the minus three, is able to win the competition and be the first one to be reported, or sometimes it would be this one here, etc. cetera. 
So the first recall probability shows the functional size of the buffer, or functional size of the activation buffer. Okay. Now, the thing is, you cannot get this out of a single store model. You have to assume two things, activation and a trace strength. And that trace strength has a negative recency profile, and activation has a positive recency profile. And together, they produce, they can produce this, uh, this finding. Now, it also means that you can look at reaction times. I will not address that today, because um, there's a whole other literature that has been um, not used uh, in current thinking. So I want to go beyond the debate um, and show some new stuff. So why is this short-term store useful? In the past, I only focused on reading, comprehension, and <coughs> contextual maintenance, because that's, uh, uh, some of my collaborators and I have, um, have some background in that. But recently, I started to look at the method of processes. That method of processes provide signals that we can use to control our learning and our memory. So one big framework that I found in literature is the one by Nelson and Nerens. Again, this is a very complicated figure, but uh, I will parse it for you. This is study, what happens during study. This is what happens during your attention, and this is a retrieval. So let's say you're studying for an exam, you work very hard, then it takes some time before uh, um, you actually have the exam. At the exam, you retrieve the items. Now, you, at each stage, you can monitor your uh, performance, and you can control your performance. I'll show you one example what uh, those people have suggested for the termination of study. So when do you know that you have studied enough? When do you know that you'll be ready for your exam? Um, and some new stuff that I'm going to present is uh, confidence in your retrieved answers. So you're going to monitor how well you are able to, um, uh, how confident are you in your answer? And uh, me and my colleagues at uh, Maryland, we have started to look at these aspects in free recall. When do you decide to terminate your search? When do you think you have either searched enough to your memory system? And how do you select strategies to help you with your search? So this uh, termination of study. Um, here, I want just want to point this out to you. That So this is not my theory here. This is a theory in the medical of literature. And the, the literature is full with examples of how short-term memory is important for metacognitive control. You monitor what was now in your current short-term memory system, and you decide whether that activation or that amount of information is good enough to perform well later on. If not, you're going to study more, and you keep it. So uh, you actually monitor how long the input to that unit will be. Um, now, it would be nice if someone would actually model this, but this is just to indicate there is some uh, precedence for the next um, slide, which is confidence in your retrieved answer. So you have to assess how well you've learned uh, for an exam. So in the exam, so uh, in, in the classroom, you study basically cute target pairs. Let's say you do French, you learn dog, chien. Now, what you can do at home when you're studying for your exam is present dog, and you can think about it. You can do two things. Well, multiple things, but two things here. Um, you can say, how likely is it that you'll be able to retrieve Sha? Not retrieving it, but how likely will you be able to do that? Or what you can do is just give your answer and tell yourself how confident are you about your response. Now, in order to keep on learning, what you want to do is relearn those that you have low likelihoods for. And in this paper, they showed that it actually increases your learning rate if you relearn those you have a low feeling of learning for, or a judgment of learning. Um, or you can relearn those for which you have low confidence. I couldn't find a, a reference for that one. Um, now, 
that means that if you have low confidence for a particular answer, that answer should be more likely to be incorrect. So do we find it in the literature? Yes, we do. Very recently, um, Dorothy showed that um, if this is the confidence in your answer from 0 to 100% confidence, and this is the proportion of items that are assigned as judgment, so this is a distribution of confidences, you see that for items that you are incorrect, you are very uh, not confident about uh, your answer. But as for those that are correct, you are very confident about that. Uh, now you could say, well, this is because you retrieved it, but that's exactly the point. While studying, you try to retrieve it, you give an answer, you say how confident you are. For those that you're not confident, they're more likely to be incorrect. So what you have to do as a learner, we learn those that you're not confident about until you do it. Or at an exam, just keep on uh, retrieving the answer from your memory until you feel that you're confident and then you put down your answer on paper. So I'll use a simple model where, again, showing that short memory is important. Um, here, you have to give a binary response, yes, no, or true, false, in a particular um, uh, um, yeah, multiple choice kind of uh, test. The responses we already know from some literatures very recently, actually, that uh, competition between responses decreases after you give a correct response, and competition increases after you've given an incorrect response. So that's what we already know from the literature, that there's a different distributions. Can we use that? Here my take on it is that confidence is related to conflict. Confidence is the inverse of conflict. If, you're, if you have these two items or these two um, um, decisions, yes, no, being activated, you give a response, and you're not very certain, that means that the other one is still lingering on in activation, it's still on short-term memory, it's still lingering on. And then you, that gives you a conflict measure. So you're very uh, inconfident about your response. Um, so it means that both responses need to be active in order to compute this measure. So would that, I put, made a toy model, would that be sufficient to get that profile we saw before, this profile here? So let's look at the distribution of the conflict. So this is a conflict measure that's uh, calculated after a person has made a response, and there's a relative frequency of that. So these are distributions of those conflict measures. For a correct response, you have a very low conflict. For incorrect response, you have a very high conflict. So that replicates uh, what's already in the literature. Putting that through a scaling parameter, it maps quite nicely on where it's, when it's incorrect, you're very low in confidence, when it's correct, you're very high in confidence, and it's not much in between. So this toy model uh, gives a proof of possibility. Now, this is one of the future challenges to do, and I want to uh, say to you that here, primary memory is an active process, like no can Norman, uh, can Norman uh, what um, Don Norman said. Uh, and a short and long-term recency are different, so we have to go beyond the debate. We know that short and long-term recency are different, um, and that data challenges single store models. Even though you're able to come up with a single store model for all these dissociations, you still have to account for how um, aspects in the meta-memory literature use short-term memory to do the, the, uh, what they do. If single store uh, modelers would say um, that short term memory is only used for metacognitive kind of processes, then one has to ask the question how is it that we have a short term memory for metacognition and never use it in free recall? It's not adaptive. If a system has, or if the organism has all these different components and not use that to uh, increase the uh, performance. Active maintenance is needed for the kind of control over learning and memory. And lately, or lastly, computation modeling is uh, for the research to ask the how question and not the you're wrong question. So we have to go beyond the debate and actually ask ourselves, 
how does it work? And that's where um, multidisciplinarity come in. I will leave it at that. If there was no noise, but there's noise. It's, oh, so you introduce noise. Into yeah, the, the noise is very important. Was at the end yeah, okay. that's a yeah, that's a okay. noise. Yeah, Without the, noise, it would be yeah. How you get to probabilistic statements from a deterministic model of introducing noise? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, the recurrent activation is the alpha parameter. That's what it um, relates to. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, well, there, so there's a number of ways you can have control. So you, you can have control over the items that are currently in active uh, memory. You can have control over the input, so how strong you actually allow uh, items to actually go into the system. Um, we have another model where... Um, it's more like a modulation of input coming into the system. Um, you can have control of what's being retrieved. So you can retrieve other items that can have influence on what's currently in short term memory. Um, it's again task dependent on how you define control. For this example that I showed earlier, one would have uh, a self based reading test where you only press the key if you decide that you have learned enough from this particular word, or you have encoded those words to a sufficient level of activation, only then you press, you, uh, you press a key. That's a control. You have that under control. If uh, I present things very fast, you only retrieve the first few items. But if I uh, ask you to retrieve all of the items, what you want to do is control how fast the rate will be. Right? So it is all, these aspects, all these parameters can be under some form of control. And it's up to yeah, modelers actually in the field to find out how this control is um, established and what's the signal for that. Um, uh, beta. So uh, you cannot have a beta of zero. So there is a structural limit to the number of things you can have active. So if beta is, uh, I think the lowest I use is 0.1. And however high alpha is increased, it still reaches an upper threshold of what can be active simultaneously. Oh, structural, we know there's interneurons in the brain. And um, if you don't have beta in there, all of the ideas will remain active indefinitely. Because that's what we actually well, I guess the question <coughs> was whether there was some you know, rational analysis or something that you could look at and say, well, given, given what you need to mm. what you need for the memory, short term memory for, you know, we've evolved to have these certain parameters that in most situations, Having a set to give us four, whether it's four or seven plus or minus two, um, it, it turns out to be the optimal setting. Right. Yeah. That's what we have. We do the experiments, right? That's why you see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, as opposed to some other uh, I've looked at uh, some of the aspects there. Um, so recently I got a paper accepted where they, well, what I did was looking at how people retrieve from from uh, uh, memory in general, and look at the retrieval times. And it turns out if you have uh, an infinite capacity, you will always retrieve everything. 
this is not very useful if you make, have to make a decision whether to go left or right. You, you want, just want to select one thing. In order to do that, you have to have a beta program.